In October, I had the good fortune to visit the stables of historic equitation. I cycled 80 miles and arrived at a farmstead upon the sleepy hills of Northamptonshire. During my weekend stay, I was met with fabulous company, most notably that of Toby Capwell, who hosted a two-day lecture providing a deep dive into the world of 13th and 15th century jousting and tournamenteering. A very inspiring introduction to some intriguing horsemanship and historic harness which followed both lectures. It was during this event where I purchased one of my most prized possessions to date, a signed copy of Capwell's new book, Armour of the English Knight, 1450 to 1500. A document which will help me greatly for my future 1461 English harness, which I will be dubbing the Towton Kit. Day one was everything 13th century, awe inspiring discussions about the armour, heraldry, helmets, surcoats, harness and training required for such a talented spectacle. So without further ado, let us dive into a bit of what I learned during the lecture of the 13th century jousting. First, let's begin with the origins of the joust. We first begin to see evidence of jousting, albeit in a primitive form, in 842 AD, with the games of horsemanship held in celebration of the alliance of Louis the German and Charles the Bald, claimed to take the title for the first ever official jousting event. Somewhat simple manoeuvres, where two teams, quote, turned about and charged with lances couched, and then made peace again, and rode along in an even line. Accounts at the time described these actions as if simulating armed battle before breaking free and from the melee to regroup and repeat. It was no coincidence that military cavalry tactics had evolved during this time, with cavalry charges on the flanks of infantry proving to be an effective method. So, evidently, an organised group of riders initiating and completing a cavalry charge as one cohesive unit seemed like the key to winning most battles on an open plain during this time. However, the books of conduct regarding jousting had not yet been written, and so the lines between good-hearted sport and all-out battle-like combat often became blurred. The games had to be reined in before things got out of hand. The rules of jousting gradually became more and more refined over the centuries to come. After the Norman invasion of England in 1066, horsemanship and mounted combat became even more prevalent, especially as tales of the cavalry charges at Hastings spearheaded by valiant knights spread across both Britain and mainland Europe, a propaganda in favour of the new feudal system finding its foothold on Anglo-Saxon soil. Married with this, a popularity of jousting also soared, becoming a favoured sport amongst the gentry, going side by side with deer hunting and falconry, sports reserved for the upper crust of the feudal classes. In 1194, Richard I decreed the licensing of tournaments in England, allowing people to joust with official royal approval for the very first time, rather than being a private sport being held between the local gentry. Thanks to this decree, as the generations went on, it certainly seemed that a knight, young or old, was almost duty-bound to take up the lance and practice their form in order to compete for the multitude of jousting events which took place all across Europe, which were becoming ever increasingly extravagant to suit the class of people who took interest in the sport. Long days spent at the Quintain, exhausting both horse and rider, Hours spent gradually getting the horse used to the sound of clashing wood and steel. Knights in training would often find themselves paying through the nose for replacement lances, each one having to be hand-carved fit for purpose. It was not long after the decree of King Richard, however, where royally decreed jousting saw one of its first teething problems. In the early 13th century, English knights were found jousting with French knights, a highly offensive slap in the face for King John, who took over the throne after his brother, Richard I, died in 1199, 
considering England at this time was currently in open war with Prince Louis of France. Not only were these English knights jousting with the French, most of whom were barons and supposedly loyal to the crown, but they were inevitably talking to each other, discussing politics and imposing opinions. Indeed, some of the very same knights who the English were sporting with were the very same knights reporting back to Louis and influencing the direction of the war. The Barons' Wars is a subject which I discuss in one of my earliest videos, of which I'll leave a link to in the description. As a result of the Barons' Wars, royal prohibitions were issued regarding the hosting of tournaments in England, coupled with strict punishments for opposing these prohibitions, commonly in the form of temporary confiscation of land from the knights responsible. I would love to talk about the notable character Sir William Marshall here, as he gains a lot of significance during this time, especially with jousting. However, I believe he deserves a dedicated video to himself. King John died in 1216, and when his son, Henry, became of age, he became King Henry III of England, and found himself immediately under pressure to relax the constrictions surrounding the sport of jousting. The next generations that followed saw an inevitable loosening of restrictions, and once again the joust was a celebrated national sport within England, with numerous events being held within the walls of new fancy castles of the 13th century, which were a grandiose upgrade to the timber palisade modern baileys of the Norman era. The tournamenteering events were rich in splendour and outright luxury. Music played, banquets held, heraldry being flown proudly from flagpoles and standard bearers alike. Ornamented tents and pavilions turned grass fields into flash floods of colour, surely a sight to behold, and indeed a claim to fame for many newly embellished castles, notably Warwick and Kenilworth. Now let's take a look at the classic armour of the 13th century jouster. A chainmail hauberk would be worn which covered the torso and draped down often covering down to the knees with a split on the front and back of the bottom of the skirt, allowing the rider to sit upon the horse with ease. The chainmail was made of riveted lengths between 5 and 8 millimetres of inner dimension. During the 13th century, mail was by far the most common knightly armour, with small elements of plate armour beginning to appear, most notably on the kneecaps elbows, shoulders, and over the armpits. These hauberks would also include male sleeves and sometimes integrated chainmail mitten gloves with leather pads sewn on for grip. These male hauberks would also often have an integrated coif which would be also made out of chainmail. The links in the male coif would also be riveted and the links would generally be smaller to allow for more comfortable and more manoeuvrable fit for the wearer. Earlier in the 11th century, these coifs would be a separate hood, however in the 13th century they gradually became integrated as one piece with the hauberk. Below the hauberk, knights would wear padded hose, sometimes with a steel knee pad stitched into the front of the padding. These would commonly have more chainmail over the top of them, in the form of male chaucers. Male chaucers would be point-tied to a load-bearing belt around the waist or a London ear. Although there are multiple ways of attaching chainmail chaucers in an attempt to evenly distribute the additional weight. Chaucers are often the most challenging part of chainmail armour to reproduce in the modern day due to the headache of all the different measurements and articulation to take into consideration. The more advanced male chaucers would also include foot protection, often either a fully enveloped sock of chain mail, or the top and sides would be male, with leather stitched onto the underside. Surcoats were an option which grew in popularity by the 13th century, as heraldry was becoming more and more common. Knights would wear a linen or wool, often sleeveless surcoat, with heraldic colours, which helps twofold, to show off the family name and heritage during a joust, and to help identify the person during battle. 
Surcoats also helped to protect the mail and provided a further layer of protective padding through the method of absorbing incoming strikes, albeit slightly. However, this extra defense would limit the impact on the riveted mail rings of a hauberk underneath. In this video, I'm not going to talk about 13th century swords and daggers, as although these were sometimes used in cavalry tournaments, they weren't used in the standard jousts. The most common helmet of the early 13th century would have been the classic nasal helmet, gradually adopting a face guard. As the 13th century unfolded, the faceplay also evolved and the Great Helm became the new favoured helm for Joust, already becoming a popular cavalry helmet for the gentry. Finally, the knights would equip a lance and shield. The jousting lance would still have a similar geometry of the lancing spear, however they were often made of a lighter, more breakable wood, and featured blunt spearheads. During the 11th and 12th century, the shield would have been a standard Norman kite shield, but during the beginning of the 13th century, this shield would gradually evolve into a more familiar curved triangular shape of the heater shield, made from wood and linen, sometimes featuring a metal square plate to ensure extra protection for the holder's arm behind the shield. In contrast to 15th century jousting, armour was much less tailored specifically for the sport, and was, for the most part, the same armour used in warfare. It is only later when we see sport armour reserved for tournaments. As the horses got faster, and lancers got heftier, the sport became more competitive and dangerous. But, that's a story for another time.